Father, we thank you today. And Lord, we rejoice in your goodness, Lord. We thank you, Father, for your power and your grace. And Father, we pray today, Lord, that you would move mightily in our midst. Lord, that you would ignite in the spirit today these truths. Father, help us to believe and not be doubters, but be believers. And Father, we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You can be seated. Turn in there and say, I'm a believer. Can you give me just a little bit more up? A little bit more volume. Thank you. Amen. Well, you look good today, everybody. I'm going to start a new series today. It's called The Best of Both Worlds. Amen. Now, this is very powerful because... It's only in the New Testament that we have the promise of having the best of both worlds. In Isaiah 1 and 10, it says that if you're willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But that was only this world. But in the New Testament, it says this. It says that godliness is profitable not only in this this life, but in the life to come. So there's a double blessing. Today's message is really about how can I really know that I'm believing to the point that it's going to change my life? How do I really know that? I was praying and I said, Lord, why is it there's so much immorality in the church and outside the church in today's church? And he said this to me. This was just this morning. He said this to me. He said, because they don't really believe see if you believe the building's on fire and you really believe it you won't sit there to see what happens amen and I believe in America today the American church we need to really take a fresh look at what we really believe in the word do we really believe what God's word says or or, or are we just Fake in it. Is it kind of a mental ascent or do we really, really, really believe what God's word says? Because it's not about, well, my intentions were, were right, but I went about it the wrong way. It's more about, did you really, 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 really believe? And I believe that the more that we get into the word of God and begin to evaluate it, the more we begin to say to ourselves, am I really a believer here or is it all in my head? Do I really believe what the word says or am I on this other path? Because if we want to have the best in this life and also in the life to come, we got to be believers. Amen. Amen. And so today I want to talk about that. And the very first place I want to start with is this. I believe in today's society, our moral compass is off. Amen. Amen. And I believe in the church, our moral compass is off. And remember something, if your moral compass is off, it's going to affect your belief. The reason why we succumb to wrong ways of behavior is because we don't believe that God's a provider. We don't believe that God will satisfy us. We don't believe that God will give us peace. We don't believe that his way will bring the best results in our lives. So we are tempted then to just succumb to ways that are wrong. But I want to show you something in the Word that's very important. In today's church, we preach a lot on grace. I finished my book, Secrets of Grace, and uh, I believe in the grace message. But a lot of people have taken it in the wrong light. And they've taken it and they said, all right, I'm not saved by what I do, which is completely true. And then they say, then it doesn't matter what I do. And that is completely untrue. When you have faith in God's grace, it, it, it brings you to a place of change. It brings you of a a a place where you trust God and you actually follow God and you actually do what God's word says because you really, really believe. It's not about not doing anything. It's about believing and doing something. That's what it's about. And so I want to discuss that for a minute, if you would. So look up here on the screen here in Romans chapter 3. And I want to show you a couple verses that talk about the law and grace. People say, Pastor, I'm not under the law. I'm under grace. Well, this is what Paul said. He said, do we then make the void the law through faith? Certainly not. 
On the contrary, we establish the law. Now, what is he saying? He, he preached repeatedly that you're no longer under law. So what does he mean we establish it? He means this, that when you get saved and you believe on Christ, then the love of God starts operating through you. And the love of God fulfills all of the law. You won't have to worry about the Ten Commandments because love doesn't steal. You won't have to worry about uh, thou shall not commit adultery because love doesn't commit adultery. In other words, the love, the love of Christ fulfills everything that was taught in the Old Testament completely. In fact, look here in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul is preaching and he talks about how he ministers to the Jews and how he ministers to the Gentiles. He says, when I'm with a Gentile or a Jew, I act like a Jew in order that I might win them to Christ. And when, when I'm with a Gentile, I act like a Gentile so that I might win them to Christ. And then he makes this statement, which is very significant. He says, to those who are without law, he's talking about Gentiles, as without law, watch this, not being without law towards God, but under law towards Christ that I might win those who are without law. So he's not saying he doesn't live without law. He lives by the law of Christ. Galatians chapter 6 verse 2 says this, that if you bear one another's burdens, you are fulfilling the law of Christ. Can you say amen, everybody? But pastor, how in the world do we interpret the Old Testament and the New Testament? How do we put it all in the sink where I'm not under the law, but yet I'm living above it in the, in the area of love? How do I do that spiritually? How do I believe rightly concerning that so that my life changes? How do I do that? Well, let me give you three, three, three things that'll help you. Number one, in the Old Testament, the law was made up of three things. You might write, write this down. The first one was God's moral law, the Ten Commandments. Second is God's civil law, which was for Israel, how they would operate, just like we have laws of speed limits and so forth. They had civil laws. And then thirdly was the temple law. In other words, how do you offer up a sacrifice? What feast should you uh, observe and all those kinds of things. And that was all in the Old Testament. Now, we're not under that, but now watch this. The moral law, I'll get to that last, but the civil law was regulations in the word that told a farmer how to treat his animals. Told a farmer not to mix seed to make it inferior. In other words, there were laws that made their culture and their and their uh, their agriculture fruitful and all those things, which changes with every culture. But how does a New Testament believer use it in his own life? Paul's the best example. Paul, you remember this verse? Paul said this. He says, "Do not be unequally un un oaked with unbelievers." That was a law that was taught to a farmer that you were not to yoke up a donkey with an oxen. Because a donkey would feed on weeds and garbage and his breath was so foul that if he was yoked to an oxen, the oxen would become sick being hooked to it. So God made a law, don't do that. And Paul takes that law that was for animals takes the wisdom out of it and says to the church, don't be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Don't get hooked up with darkness or the darkness is going to affect you spiritually. It's a civil law, right? So he takes the wisdom. The wisdom doesn't change. The wisdom stays. Amen? Another time the apostle Paul says this. He says that, that he took a law that when an oxen is treading, or working in the field, they are allowed to eat from what they trample over or whatever. And he takes that same law and applies it to the church and says that you should take care of your pastors and support them. Amen. 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 But it's a civil law, right? But there's wisdom in it. Amen. And so in the Old Testament, you can go through and you can find wisdom everywhere. And you apply it to our situation per se. Now we're not under those regulations because we're under the law of love. But the wisdom is applicable today that we need to embrace. Praise God.
And then you had the laws of the temple. Well, you got to observe this sacrifice or this sacrifice and do all this. And all of it was for one reason. It was to point them to Christ who's coming. In other words, they got used to believing that, listen, our sins will not be dealt with unless somebody gives a sacrifice. So Jesus comes, he's the lamb of the world, takes away the sins of the world. Now all that teaching that they had all of a sudden took them from grade school to college and now the, the Messiah is here and now they see him as the lamb of God. Amen? Do you see that? And then in the temple you had the tithe and you had all those regulations that you'd bring to the priest to support them. And the same principles of the 10% were in the Old Testament when they tithe to Melchizedek. It's just a spiritual principle that God puts in the church from every generation. doesn't matter whether there's a, a temple where animals are sacrificed or whether it's the church today or whether it's the time during Abraham. These are the same principles. And you just apply it to what we have today. Amen? Isn't that exciting? So I said all that to say this, that I'm not lawless. I have the law of Christ in my life and I can trace it back to the Mosaic law. In other words, if I want to find the root to everything that Christ did for me, I can find it in the Old Testament. I can find the sacrifices. I can find him saying, love your neighbor as yourself. Of course, we couldn't do that because we didn't like ourselves that much, but Jesus came and showed us how to do it. Amen. And you can find verses that say, love God with all your heart. I couldn't do that because my heart was corrupt. But Jesus could. Amen. And so we don't throw it all out. We just interpret it with grace. Which means I don't become lawless in my life. And this is the part that really troubles me in the church today. Is we got couples that are living together and they justify it and say, well, I'm living together because, you know, we're going to get married. It's okay. And because, see, you got to understand where I'm coming from. When I grew up, there were laws that were, it was illegal to smoke pot. And if you got caught smoking pot, you'd go to jail. And if you sold weed to people, you went to jail for a long time. Those were the laws. Now they've changed. Now it's acceptable. Now it's acceptable to be a homosexual. Now it's acceptable to be a, a lesbian. There's nothing wrong with it. It's perfectly legal. Now it's legal to live with somebody. Everything, everything's legal. It's all, it's all legal. And, it's, and the Bible calls this the mystery of lawlessness. And what the church has done is we've allowed the world's compass to become our compass. That's what we've done. And the problem with it is this. It's because we don't really believe. If we really believe that God was a provider, we would tithe. If we really believe that God is who he says he will and that you can be married to one woman all your life and be happy, if you, if you just really believe that God would sanctify and bless that marriage to a degree that you don't need anyone else, if you really believe, if you really believe that, that staying away from it until you get married is actually beneficial for you after you get married, there wouldn't be any problems. But because we don't believe that, because some psychologist says, no, 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 no. It's better to live, live together for a while. After a while, you know, you want to try it, try it out a little bit first. Then if it don't work out, it's easier to do that than to break it off, than to get married. It's kind of like, you know, if you want to buy a car, you take it out and test drive it first. But that doesn't, marry you, you, that doesn't mean you keep it for a year. <laughs> I want you to hear my heart when I say this. If you really, really, really believe you're going to do these things, it's when we doubt, well, I'm not sure that's true. Maybe that's not what he meant. Then we begin to vacillate. And we try to figure out in our mind what, what we have to do and what we don't have to do. And we don't reach that, that God level of love. Wow. God's love has never been in divorce court. I'm not trying to make anybody feel bad. I want to live at a high level. 
I want his love to be alive in my life. And the Bible says in 1 John 3, that if a heart does not condemn us, then we have confidence before God and that whatever we ask we receive because we keep his commandments and do those things pleasing in his sight. In other words, my confidence is the byproduct of me believing and doing, believing and doing, believing and doing, believing and doing, believing and doing. Now I got confidence. I'm not going to harbor anything against you because I got two big of petitions waiting to be answered that I'm not going to let you steal from me. The cost is too great to be able to do that. So let me give you an example of this in Scripture. Look with me to Proverbs 3, verse 9 and 10. Look what it says. Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase. Pastor, I know I'm supposed to tithe off my Salary, but what about my other stuff? It says right there, every increase. Every increase. Every investment. Every profit. All your increase. Okay, now watch this. Watch this. So your barns, not barn, will be filled with lack. What? Plenty. Plenty. Why? Because if you're faithful a little, he give you much. Okay? And your vats will overflow. Oh, I like that. With new overflow. Oh. Overflow means it goes beyond the capacity that it was made for. It goes over it and it flows over it. That's overflow. See, in, in the day that this was written, they would stamp out wine with their feet in these wine vats and they were tall enough they could handle the normal harvest of that day. But he said, no, I'm going to give you a harvest that goes beyond what you can contain. It's similar to what Jesus or what it says in Malachi where it says, I'm going to open the windows of heaven for you and I'm going to pour a blessing upon you that is so great you got room, you don't have room enough to contain it. In other words, watch this, watch this. You're in the anointing, the anointing falls, God's blessing your, your house. You got one child, you got three bedrooms, and you come to church, the anointing hits you, and your wife has triplets. Woo. <laughs> you gotta buy a bigger house. <laughs> hey man, you thought you just had enough money, you don't take one through college, now you got four to put through college and weddings. He says, I'm going to bless you so much that you're going to have to increase your capacity. Instead of a one-car garage, you're going to need a two-car garage. Teenagers, you're going to need a four-car garage. (laughs) It's just going to (laughs) expand, expand, expand. Do you see what he's trying to do here? He's trying to sweeten you up with a promise to believe in. Here's what the potential could be. If you really, 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 really believed. That's powerful. Powerful. And then he says, I'll rebuke the devourer for you. And let me show you how this ties into confidence. Last year, our refrigerator broke. And it's a Viking refrigerator, a very expensive refrigerator. And I had to get that expensive one because of the way my kitchen was made up. And so it breaks. And I'm going, God... I'm a tither. He said you'd rebuke the devourer. And so I'm trying to fix this thing. I can't figure out what's wrong. I call up the guy and he's, he's telling me somewhere between five, six hundred dollars to come out and look at it and fix it. And I'm thinking, man, I don't want to do this. I'm a tither. So I just kept going to the Lord and said, Lord, I'm a tither. This is not right. I want a blessing here. So I called him up one more time. He says, well, try this. Turn the, the, the freeze level down lower. So I did it. Nothing happened. I called him back. He says, well, I don't know. It's probably going to cost you maybe $1,000 to get it fixed. And because he, he hadn't yet come out. Or, or this is the second time I talked to him. Anyway, but, but, then, but then I said, all right, let's just wait. And my wife's going, I want water. 
I want water every day. I want my water. Fix my water. I'm saying, we got bottled water. It's beautiful. Take the bottled water. But she wants it out of the refrigerator. So I get my tools together. I'm taking the door apart. I'm doing all this stuff, hoping and praying I can put this thing back together correctly. (laughs) And all I did is find out how to electrocute myself. (laughs) That's all I did. So I put it back together, and then I thought, you know, maybe I need to turn the temperature down lower. So I turned it down a little bit lower. I waited a few days. It started running. And it's been running ever since. Praise God. <laughs> but see, this is what I'm talking about. There's a, there's a confidence that says God will take care of me because he says in the word. And when my voice went out seven years ago and I was going to all these doctors, I went to LA for a, for a month. I did all this stuff. Spent about $45,000, something like that. A lot of money. Money I didn't have. But we just put it on the card. Put it on the card. And without a, without a raise from the, from the board, without telling one of you to give me any money, all the money came in I needed for it. Because yeah. I'm a tither. Yeah. People would do me favors. People would do different things. It was wonderful. And it's because you're a tither. You're a tither. Now, now I know this ain't, this ain't just a tithing message. This is a doing message where we do the word. I, I want you to believe it. I want you to live right. I want you to follow God. I want you to have his moral compass in your life, not the world's compass. Join us at the river on Wednesdays and Sundays for weekly services, as well as great programs for kids, youth, and young adults. Visit riveroflifefellowship.org to view our calendar of events. There's something for everyone at the river where family matters.